Well, it's nice to put a face to the voice because I've heard so much of your voice. Uh, so let's just start from the beginning. Talk to me about how you first learned about the Kristen Smart case. Well, I, I think I learned about it the way that most locals did. I, I grew up just uh, 15 minutes south of where the billboard is. And when you drive by this billboard with this reward money and this girl's name and missing Cal Poly student, um, the, reality, the reality of it uh, really hits you. And so I spent my childhood um, hearing her name on the news and being reminded every so often that she was still missing. And it's probably three years ago now, going on three years, that I kind of delved in and thought, let me just try to explore this story as deeply as I can. And then got frustrated that there wasn't a documentary about it. I wanted, you know, that's how most people like to consume these stories at this point, I think. And there wasn't one already made. And so I started working on my own. Right. And so why a podcast? Why was that your chosen method of telling this story? I'm a musician and recording engineer, and I've worked in recording studios for uh, 10 or more years now. And so I'm, I'm an audio guy, and I had also started my own podcasts in the past. I did interview podcasts. I did like TV recap podcasts where we'd talk about a TV show every week. Um, so I had the equipment, and I had the experience. I knew how to get a podcast online and all that. And I also thought, if I do a video documentary, I'm going to have to hire a crew. I'm going to have to get all this expensive equipment. And every decision I make in the storytelling has to be run by like 20, 30 people, depending on how big this crew gets. With audio, I can do pretty much every part of this myself. And that was easier for me. And it turns out that you made a podcast when podcasts completely took off and everybody started listening to them. So that definitely worked out, I think, in your favor. Um, but so I know you kind of started this project. You started reaching out to other people who had covered the case or who had a vested interest in the case. When did you realize that maybe you were in a little deeper than you thought you might go into this? That happened in so many ways. There were so many steps where I thought, wow, I'm getting in deeper and deeper. I never thought I'd get this far. Um, the first one was when I realized I had acquaintances who had gone to high school with Paul Flores and gone to parties with Paul Flores and had bad experiences with him. And then they started connecting me. I'll tell you five other people you should ask about this. And then it kept spreading. And each time I would think, well, that's probably as far as I'll get. I would reach someone who said, oh, no, actually, Paul Flores like violently assaulted me. And then they would be willing to open up. And I thought, wow, this is info that's not already out in the general public. This is not part of the story that's been told. And then being given access to like the depositions and things like that. Um, being able to see Paul's interview with the DA investigators for the first time, things that are not publicly available, but that through personal connections in my own backyard, that people were willing to share that with me. It's part of doing a story in your hometown is realizing I probably already know somebody who has a piece of this puzzle. Yeah, did you grow up in AG or what part of the Central Coast did you grow up in? I grew up in Orchid. It's just south of Santa Maria, and so it's not very far. Yeah. Um, and as you kept learning more, I mean, I dealt with the same thing on a smaller scale, obviously, because I had a really limited time frame to finish my project. But talk to me about the feeling of, you know, constantly learning more and realizing how much information is out there and how deep you can get into this story. What was that like for you? I mean, was it overwhelming? Was it exciting? I think it was exciting. I think that mostly at the, at the onset, at least, I thought I can dispel some of the legends and myths that have been, there, there's several things that have been talked about over the years that once I dug in, I thought, well, that's not the truth at all. And maybe if I put that in there and clarify, we can get to the truth. Um, but then realizing things that have just never been spoken about. And I think you experienced the same thing, getting to know people who had heard a rumor that she was buried in a location and went through the trouble of like, getting a team together, chartering a helicopter, digging in spots. There are people all over the Central Coast who have wanted to find Kristen. And that was part of what sucked me in at the beginning was 
why aren't we all looking for this girl every single day? We know she's here nearby. We know who she's tied to and who likely did this. Let's start looking in locations they were connected to. Someone's got to find her. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so you put out the first podcast episodes beginning of 2019, right? Is that correct? 2019. It was September. Right. Um, and what was the initial response? And were you expecting it? Um, I had started promoting it on social media the year before. And so I put out a trailer and stuff and people seemed really excited. And then I would post little updates to Instagram and I could tell the community was like eager for this. They were, they were eager for this story to be told on a massive scale. I think when the first episode dropped, I was totally unprepared for how quickly the word of mouth was going to spread. I never paid a penny to promote this podcast. I never, uh, boosted any, uh, Facebook posts or anything or, or a number of ways that I've promoted podcasts in the past. I didn't do anything with this one. I just put it out and everyone started talking about it. And by the time episode two came out, I was starting to get a little nervous that there's a lot of pressure on me now. And I hope that this doesn't uh, fizzle out. You know, I hope that the later episodes are as strong as the earlier episodes. So people don't start going, all right, that was boring. That was the first couple were okay. And then it got weak. And so each week that I was sitting down to edit, it was like a race against time to get it online and make it as good or better than the previous one. And then I had people like messaging me all morning saying, where's it at? It's late. It's supposed to be here at midnight. And so, um, the, yeah, the word of mouth and the way that it spread are completely shocking to me still. But now after this week and all the developments that have been happening for the past month, it's just shot up. It's been the number one podcast in the U S for the last six days in a row now. And, um, at this point, I know, you know, I, I told the story and then there were arrests and I had some small part of that. I, I, I'm not even really appreciating the success because at this point, the success is that things are happening in real life. It's great that people are listening and it's continuing to spread, but the goal is still to find Kristen and that hasn't been done, but we're closer than we've ever been. Absolutely. I'm going to get to all the progress that's been made in just a second, but I want to stick to how popular this podcast has become. Do you know off the top of your head how many times it's been downloaded or listened to? I think today it's approaching 9 million downloads. And then I, I haven't really found a way to see analytics of listens. And I'm curious about that because a lot of people don't even bother to click the download button. They just stream it uh, live. And so I'm really not sure, but um my understanding early on was that only the top 1% of all podcasts in existence get uh, 35,000 downloads in one week. And in my first week I had 75,000. And so I thought just right off the bat, I'm up there with the top of the top podcasts. And like I said, it's a little stressful to then have the pressure of that and see, can I follow up with this? Um, cause the downside came with that too. The more listens I get, the more negative people start feeding into that too. And I've seen some really terrible things said about my voice or things that people didn't enjoy about it. Um, but that goes with the territory. The more people that are listening, uh, the more people feel both ways about it. Well, there's always going to be the haters. Trust me. I work in news, but <laughs> you're, you have done a fantastic job objectively with the podcast. I know that like I've I was part of it on some level, so I'm a little biased, but I think you've done a fantastic job and the quality of it is top notch. Um, so millions of people have downloaded this, have listened to it. I think I checked your Instagram. You have like 67,000 Instagram followers, which is mind blowing. Um, what do you think the power is of telling this story on a level where so many people, it's reached so many people at this point, what power do you think that has? Um, in the sheriff's press conference, the day of the arrest, he made it pretty clear that because of the scope of the podcast and as far as it spread, there was this phenomenon where there were people on the other side of the country who would reach out to me and say, I went to Cal Poly at that time. I didn't keep up with this case. I thought it was resolved a long time ago, but now that I know it wasn't, I might have a valuable piece of info. And they would reach out to me because they were comfortable with me or they'd listened to the podcast and trusted me. And then I would take their info and go to detectives and say, do you already know about this? Can I connect you to, can I get you talking to this person? And there were several witnesses that I connected with detectives that ended up being a, 
a piece of the formula that led to the arrest, that these arrests might not have happened if some of these witnesses hadn't come forward when they did. And it happened because the podcast spread the way that it did. Yeah, I know. Listening to the sheriff's press conference and just over and over again, the DA, the sheriff talking about the podcast was so awesome. Such um such a great testament to what good journalism can do. And I know that the sheriff talked about getting international attention. I know in the last podcast episode, you interviewed the man from Australia, right? That's where he was from. Do yeah. you think that played a big role in what, right when he said that, that's what went off in my mind. Like that guy was maybe the only witness or the last witness. Do you think that played a role in the arrest? My understanding is they have not spoken with him since oh. I spoke with him. And so um, a lot of people have been messaging me this week or commenting on my posts and speculating about who was the witness in the podcast that kind of broke this. And the exciting part of this is you've never heard from the witnesses that broke this, that, that the people that I brought to detectives, they had sensitive information. An important part of getting a prosecution and making that successful is not sharing that information yet. So you've yet to hear from some people who brought out the most important information that led to an arrest. And that's part of what the sheriff's department has been thankful for my side of this is that yes, I'm telling the story and I've gained this large following, but I'm not going to compromise this investigation regardless of how juicy some of the details might be. And I think that's what separates me from a lot of the media that they're used to dealing with is trying to get as quickly as they can the juiciest detail. And sometimes that can get in the way of a prosecution. Totally. And even, you know, there hasn't been a formal documentary done by the 48 hour episodes, things like that. Um, you know, I think a lot of that falls under the traditional news model. And I can speak as a journalist of the pressure on us to get the best interview and to put out the information nobody else has. So was that you making those calls of like, I'm not going to put this out yet? Or was that a collaboration between you and investigators? How did that work? Yeah, I think I'm probably a little more sensitive about it. I don't want to do, there's a number of things I thought I'm going to sit on. And then when I brought it up to investigators, they're like, no, put that out. That's okay. Um, but they've been clear when there's certain pieces that it's like, please don't share this information. And so, um, yeah, both of us have sort of made that call. And I'm very careful to check in with attorneys, detectives, always the smart family. The smart family is number one anything you don't want me to say in the podcast, I'll hold off on saying that. And so um, there, there's a, a system of checks and balances that any info that comes in is important to the investigation, but not important to put in the podcast because that's just the storytelling side of things. And that stuff will come out eventually. Um, through the hearings this past week, there have been a number of things I've been holding on to for a while that came out and suddenly they're public. So I'm able to share them and all of those will continue to come out in the trial. And did you know that information through these witnesses or do you, have you just been kind of tied into what's going on with the sheriff's office and getting some of that information before everybody else, because you are really, you know, the first person on the front line of this case and have been for a couple of years. Yeah, it's a little bit of both. Um, it's mostly that I just kind of stay in touch with everybody. And being a nice guy has gotten me really far in this. And I think that some of the people who had worked on this case before who became a public voice, they were more assertive than I am. And they were a little more aggressive than I was. And sometimes that kind of hindered them from being able to develop relationships with people. And early on, some people started telling me one of the best parts about you is that you're just not a jerk. You're just a nice guy. And so when I do talk to people, I, I've sort of fostered relationships with a lot of the witnesses and people um, I interviewed. Sorry. Um, okay, it's all good. Um, <laughs> just wants to say hi. <laughs> um, people I've interviewed have stayed in touch with me. So pretty much anybody I've spoken to has continued to communicate with me. So let's talk about the past few weeks. Would you call this the biggest break in the case in almost 25 years? Yeah, easily. I would say after they executed the search at his father's house and what was uncovered, I'd say it's pretty much just below actually recovering Kristen, it's as good as we can get because there is direct ties now between um, the Flores family and um, 
there's at least enough to establish that they were in possession of human remains at some point. At least it appears that way now. And that's big and it's telling. And there is evidence as the court filing papers made clear this week that that was recently moved. And that's where the investigators are going to have to, it, that, um, the community has eyes, you know, there are people who witness things that may not even realize what they witnessed or how important they were. And now that people know that, that there was recent activity, they may be able to come forward with information that can help them find out where this uh, evidence was moved to. Right. And so the evidence that came out this week, which in my opinion was probably the biggest revelation of evidence in more than two decades now was that a body was at some point under Ruben Flores's deck, correct? Or somewhere in his backyard. Um, right. I, yeah. Right. Um, so did, did you know that before you read the court papers? Was that something you kind of, I mean, everybody has assumed for so long and, and all of the you know, witness testimony and circumstantial evidence that's kind of come about through the podcast and just through journalism over the past 20 something years has really pointed to either one of those backyards or something like that. But was that news to you when that came out through court paperwork or did you already know? I already knew um, a lot of it um, and, and had suspected for a long time. And there were periods of time where I was more interested in one location than another and did a lot of research. I'd get tips that, um, oh, I heard she was out here and I would go out there and look. And just top of my mind, it was always, those properties are so suspicious. And I made clear in one of the episodes of the podcast for a family in their position who have become pariahs of the community, who people, they drive by and honk every day of these people's lives. Their neighbors are suffering from how much negative attention is poured on these two families. Their children now live in, one lives in Washington State, one lives in Los Angeles County. They're nowhere near them. They've been divorced for years and yet they continue to cohabitate in those two separate houses. Um, they're always hanging out with each other. It's just, I thought, there's no way a family would stick around in a community like this with the attention they've gotten unless they felt like they were not able to abandon those homes and they wouldn't abandon them if they thought there was evidence that could be located. And I even started to think the evidence doesn't even need to necessarily be Kristen. At this point, it could just be that they know she was there at one time and they're afraid that evidence could still be collected from the soil or the concrete or a number of other locations and they're afraid that if they leave investigators will swarm those houses and luckily they didn't have to move out for that to happen it finally happened and they did find something they were looking for and yeah it was like a huge validation but it also still so surreal that I haven't been able to just sit and appreciate what happened this month yeah well we're still in the thick of it really um so you have gone out and physically looked at these locations that you've gotten tips about Mm -hmm. What I know that you know, you obviously have a natural curiosity. Um, you obviously are passionate about this case, but what drives you to take that extra step and reach out to that extra person and keep pursuing this case on a level that really nobody else has? Um, in the beginning, it was the frustration of being told over and over again. I reached out to the sheriffs. I gave them this info, and they never contacted me again. And so I thought I might be the only one taking this seriously at the beginning. So I went places with shovels. I dug places. I looked for her. I was in contact with um, volunteers with cadaver dogs who checked soil samples for me and all those things. Where so you've been very closely in contact with investigators for a while now. Um, so you kind of have a better idea than most people of how much work they've been doing. I know they talked about in the press conference how much evidence they've gathered, how many witnesses they've interviewed. But, um, you know, it's really easy, especially at the beginning of just looking into what everybody's saying and what's been reported before to say like, okay, the sheriff's office isn't doing enough. What's your take on that now, now that you really have a better idea of what has been happening behind the scenes? 
Um, a, a little mixed feelings. I, I do give the detectives a lot of credit for what they have done. They've, they've worked very hard on this. And they also care just on a personal level. We've connected over the fact that we really want to resolve this and we really want to find Kristen. And we really care about the Smart family. Um, at the same time, from the Smart family's perspective and the public, it's never enough. It's just never, ever enough. So even if they're working as hard as they possibly can, work harder. Just always, it's like, I'm sorry, the public is not satisfied. And sometimes that's just because they can't share what they're doing. And that's sort of where I come in. That's why I've been able to be a little bit of a mouthpiece for, um, they gave me the statistics of how many locations they'd searched, how many search warrants were executed, uh, how much money they've spent on this investigation since the last sheriff's administration came in when Ian Parkinson took over this case. The, the ball really got rolling. But at the same time, it's been 10 years since he took over. It took a long time to get to this point. And you, you've got uh, to admit that. It, it, it took a long time, regardless of how much the ball was rolling behind the scenes. Some of the things that have been done recently feel like they could have been done a long, long time ago. And it's not up to me to determine whether or not that's fair. I guess the detectives will at some point or the sheriff will be able to explain why some of those things took so long and maybe there's a good reason for it. But when you're the smart family and every day you're waiting for justice, it each day creeps by with no new information it can be really, really difficult. Do you think that your podcast getting so much attention, millions of people listening pushed them to work harder? That's a tough question to answer because the sheriff has been vocal in interviews oh. that it has not. Um, but I, I have to cut him a little slack because publicly that's his job. His job is to um, be the spokesperson for his department and, um, and law enforcement has worked hard on this. It is really, really hard for me to, mad to imagine that a viral podcast with millions of downloads on a case this old didn't spur them on to move a little faster than they were already moving. And the timing uh, of when the podcast started coming out and how much activity has happened since then, it's a great coincidence if that's what it is. It's, let's say that if it's a coincidence, it was a good one. It's not a coincidence. I don't think so at all. Um... Why do you feel so connected to Kristen and to the Smart family? When I watched and read interviews with the Smart family, yours were some of the first I saw, um, I thought, wow, this is a family who has just absolutely refused to give up on finding their daughter. They're sure they're defeated and sure um, this has worn on them, but every time they visit the community and do another radio or TV interview, it's clear that this is just as fresh as it ever was. And once I got to meet them and interview them, sit down with them, it became, a, there was this other level of, oh, wow. And they're really good people too. They're not just grieving parents. They're like really, really a tight family. Um, I, I got to meet Kristen's siblings and now her, what would have been her nieces and nephews. And, um, yeah, it's a tight family and they're good people. And I feel like I just got personally attached to, to their suffering. And it, it's part of the reason why even after I stopped putting out new episodes, I've never stopped being in contact with them because um, during the searches last month, everybody kept asking me, have you been in touch with the Smart Family? Do you know what the Smart Family is feeling? And I want to sort of protect them a little bit and I don't want to give away more information than they're comfortable with me sharing, but certainly I'm in touch with them almost every day. They're good friends of mine. So you have talked to them since the arrest and everything then. Yeah. You no, know, and I'm sure they are getting completely bombarded. Um, I occasionally will send Denise a text with a very, since I am like traditional media, I'm always like, this is not like, this is no pressure. You know what I mean? Of course I have, voices being like, can you get the interview? Can you do this? And I'm always just like, I'm, I don't want to come from a place of like me hounding you, you know, but I also just want her to know, like, I'm thinking of you and I'm here and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I'm not sure what you, what your beliefs are, but do you feel connected to Kristen wherever she may be? Yeah, once I visited Stockton and got to meet her childhood friends, her neighbors, her family members, th there was this moment that I was driving around Stockton alone and I had a Sheryl Crow CD on, which was one of Kristen's favorite singers. And really just overwhelmed by emotions of, I feel like I'm on my way to meet this girl and I'm not, and I never will be able to. And there was just a, a weird sense of loss for someone I never even met. And it's, it, it comes back to me in waves because I'm so often focused on the production of the podcast, interviewing witnesses, speaking with people, finding out what the sheriff's department is doing, that there's, there's moments where it hits me. Kristen was a human being who I know a lot about and feel very connected to. And I'm now friends with some of her friends and they stay in touch with me. Um, I spent last week walking around Cal Poly with one of Kristen's best friends and she had never seen some of these locations. And that was very meaningful to me on a personal level. And then I, I did a radio interview this week and told this story that sort of all of a sudden my inbox is full of people responding to this story about this rock in Pismo. It's on the 101 when you're passing Pismo, there's this big rock that juts out of the median. And for whatever reason, each time I pass that going to San Luis Obispo and then back home, I thought of Kristen. It overlooks the ocean. It's just this structure for whatever reason connected to Kristen in my mind. And I told Denise about that. And I said, I, I want to name this rock after Kristen and her childhood nickname was Critter. And so we named it Critter Point and we commissioned an artist to do a drawing of Critter Point. And there's a copy hanging on Denise's wall and there's a copy hanging on my wall now. And so it's become tradition for me and my family. Each time we pass Critter Point, we throw up the little Aloha sign and we think of Kristen. And particularly this last week, just overwhelmed driving up to see them digging up this yard, driving up to see, uh, the Flores is in court in an orange jail jumpsuit. And that moment I passed that rock, just Kristen, this is all for Kristen. Yeah. And I've seen so many people posting pictures of that, that point on the central coast too, which is amazing. Um, so are you hopeful at this point that they will find Kristen's remains? That's still the number one goal for me. Um, I know that I'm on it. I mean, I'm following it constantly. I have gotten new information. I'm continuing to stay in contact with people and I've gotten more people in touch with the sheriff's department who I don't know what follows this. And I don't know that I never know if they're a hundred steps ahead of me or if they're behind me or if they're right alongside me because everything they do has to be secret. And especially now with this gag order in place, they can't share information. And so it's, it's tough now sort of blindly guessing what they may need and how I could help with that. And I also am uh, sort of cognizant of the fact that I can't step on their toes like, and I can't get in the way. So for me, Finding out what happened to Kristen and where, if she was moved, where she was moved to is what I've been working on every day. And I believe detectives are too. I think they're doing some good work behind the scenes. And I am holding on to hope that Kristen is still somewhere where she can be recovered. Yeah, her family deserves that so much just to be able to, you know, I know they've done celebrations of life, but just to have that closure and be able to bring her home and do whatever she would have wanted with her remains and things like that. Lastly, where do you find the time to so aggressively follow this case on a daily basis? I mean, have you been able to make any sort of profit off of your podcast being downloaded so many times? Do you have a day job? How does this work for you? So I worked in a recording studio when I first started researching this. I continued to do that for about a, about a year of researching. And then I quit in May of 2019 to focus on the production of the podcast. And I wasn't sure once I put this out, I might go back to working. I'm not really sure what I'm going to do. Obviously, it's become a full-time job. Um, it is every day. Luckily, I've got a supportive family who encouraged me. Yes, please quit your job and do this. This is big. Um, my girlfriend is 
is very successful in her field and very supportive. And we're always in touch about how much longer do you think I should do this? Um, there are no advertisements in the podcast at all. And that was a big part of storytelling for me is let's not interrupt the flow of this story with some bogus commercial. I know that's how some people have to make their money, but I'm in a position here where I'll put a donate tab on my website and people can choose whether or not they want to donate to me. Also, because those commercials pay pennies uh, each time you mention an advertisement based on download numbers and all that, somebody handing you a $20 bill is probably going to be better than, than getting a certain number of downloads with a commercial in it. And so the donations have been overwhelming this month. I'm doing very well and all of that money will go back into production and being able to just sustain me while I work on this podcast because going up to San Luis Obispo and back every day this week for court hearings, being in the courtroom, taking notes, trying to get the notes to people online as quickly as I can. I'm in production of a new episode, but there's no timeline as to when I'll release that because we're, we're happening in real time now. So anything I say could jeopardize the prosecution's case and I'm not going to do that. And also there's just a number of things that I would like to say that it's probably not the right time to say. And also if I put out an episode today and there's a big break tomorrow, then I've got to rush to get in production of the next episode. So I'm going to sit on it for a while and collect information, continue to record pieces. Um, and the donations are, they're doing it for me right now. That's amazing. And your girlfriend deserves just as much of the credit for, you know, being like a part of it and giving you that space. That's incredible. And, so, and even having to live with somebody who every day is going through these documents and like showing, like I'll wake her up in the middle of the night to show her something on Google earth and be like, do you think I should go here? Is this interesting? Um, she has to listen to all of that. And luckily she, she takes it all uh, pretty well. So yeah, she deserves a lot of credit. Well, she must love you then. <laughs> uh, and Kara, of course, about the case. So looking forward, you know, we have these preliminary hearings coming up next month, the next few months now. I know you know so much information, but I'm sure there's bound to be so much more revealed during these hearings. Of course, um, audio wise, I don't know how that will work out for you not really being able to use audio, but are, how are you feeling about actually being able to witness one of these court hearings and whatever comes out of them and all the evidence that's presented and all the testimony that, uh, you know, witnesses give. Um, it's an overwhelming thought. I'm totally unqualified. Um, I know nothing about legal stuff for the last few hearings. Once they end, I have to go Google, like, what is a 1275 hold? What does that mean? And, and what could that pertain to based on what I know? Um, so there have been things that have come out already that I've thought, as far as the legal language, um, it's going to be over my head for a bit. Um, luckily, I have some good friends who are in the legal business, attorneys that I can check in with and see, like, what does this mean? And is this okay to um, summarize this? I, I'm also overwhelmed by the by sitting in a media room like I've been doing this week where it's me and then somebody from the local news station, somebody from a Los Angeles news station. We're all sitting there filming this Zoom camera and then we're all running out to our cars and trying to get it out as quickly as possible. And I don't work for anybody. So there's really no benefit to me like getting this on the air before the next network. And I also know that networks are limited in how much they can get on the air because there's so many other stories going on. For me, it's just this one story. And so I sat in my car for like an hour, like transcribing all of the notes I had written, looking things up to make sure I was correct about certain things I believed before I put it up online. And then it just I mean, it gets tens of thousands of responses now. And so I sort of view my role at this point uh, as being somebody who's steeped in this story, who knows a, a lot, if not all of the people involved and is a, sort of a trusted voice, I guess, and wanting to do the right thing and tell this story as thoroughly and exhaustively as I can. I guess that's my... Um, my role is not to rush and get things out quick to get a scoop, but to be as thorough and exhaustive as possible. Well, you've done a fantastic job and you are qualified, I promise you, because I, as a journalist who've been covering court hearings for a long time, 
do the same thing. I have a friend, I'm like, what's a protective order? What does this mean? Can you tell me what you think this would be about? Um, but you're, you're doing a wonderful job and uh, I'm rooting for you and for prosecutors from afar. And um, I just, I think that your podcast has done amazing things and I'm so proud to have been, played a little role, given you my notes. And I'm so glad that that like led you to do the work that I really didn't have the time or resources to do because it's something I've thought about so often over the past eight plus years now, just wishing I could go back and, you know, and, and do this kind of storytelling. So I just hope, you know, you have an ally in me, a resource. If, if I can help you in any way, if you need someone to run down to Stockton, I'm not far. So um, is there anything else you want to say just about what's happened recently in the case and all the attention the podcast has gotten? No, I think you've covered it pretty well. Um, it's just, it's still surreal. And it's, it's weird to have the, the court stuff going on at the same time that the podcast is becoming like international and people like, my favorite murderer are reaching out to me and they're like very supportive and these are like celebrities and then trying to keep up with the court stuff. I can't really appreciate either one because I'm so um, overwhelmed. So it's just, it's the weirdest week of my life and I'm sure it will only get weirder. I'm sure you're right. Uh, and I mean, I'm sure you know this, but this case is going to be your legacy. Finding Kristen is going to be your legacy. Honestly, I, I really believe that. And I know that the smarts feel, I mean, the fact that they've put so much trust in you um, says so much because as you know, they're, they've gone pretty quiet from doing any media interviews and it takes a lot to get them to open up to people at this point for good reason. So thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me this morning.